Well, welcome everyone uh, to this webinar, Taking the High Road, Strengthening Coastal Flood Resilience of Transportation Infrastructure. I'm Jeff Peterson. I'm with the Coastal Flood Resilience Project and I'll be moderating the event today. The webinar is jointly sponsored by the Nichols Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions at Duke University, the Resilience Roadmap Project, and the Coastal Flood Resilience Project. Our goal for the webinar is to give you a better understanding of the challenges that more severe storms and rising seas pose for transportation infrastructure on the coast and measures that can strengthen adaptation to these risks. Today, major new investments in transportation infrastructure are underway because of the recent bipartisan infrastructure legislation. And earlier this year, NOAA published its new assessments of coastal flood and sea level rise risks. So this is an important moment to consider the risks that coastal flooding poses for transportation infrastructure and possible response strategies. I'm delighted to be joined uh, by three distinguished panelists representing federal and state government and civil society. Heather Holsinger is a senior climate policy specialist in the Office of Policy in the Office of the Secretary at the U.S. Department of Transportation. Her work at the department involves policy development and analysis in the area of transportation system resilience, decarbonization, and sustainability. And Jeremy Ketchum is an assistant division chief for the Division of Environmental Analysis at the California Department of Transportation and also serves as state transportation agency representative on the California Coastal Commission. He oversees a team that develops and maintains environmental standards and practices implemented by the California Department of Transportation's uh, 12 districts. And Kim Mayer is a senior attorney at the Southern Environmental Law Center and leads the center's government accountability initiative. She's been involved in many cases involving climate change, including reaching a settlement with the North Carolina Department of Transportation that resulted in a number of new statewide climate change practices. Today's webinar is divided into three sections. First, each of the panelists will give a short presentation describing their work and commenting on coastal flood and transportation infrastructure. Second, panelists will respond to some general questions about coastal flood risks to transportation infrastructure with a chance for some discussion among the panelists. And then finally, we will take questions from the audience and please submit your questions through the Q&A functions. Uh, we also developed a background document with information on coastal flood risk to transportation assets and some of the policies and programs related to that risk. And that document also includes links to the sponsoring organization. You can find the read ahead in the, uh, we'll be posting it here in a minute in the chat. Uh, and finally, we will post the recording of the webinar on the websites of the sponsoring organizations and provide a link to all the webinar participants. With that, I want to give the floor to Heather Holsinger for her remarks. I think I'm off mute. Can you hear me, Jeff? Yes. Oh, great, thank you. And, and thank you so much for that introduction and thank you and uh, your colleagues from the Nicholas Institute for inviting me to participate in the webinar today. It's such an honor to be part of this panel with Jeremy and Kim and to talk about climate change and coastal resilience. And I'm so excited to be part of an administration that is absolutely committed to a whole of government approach to addressing climate change resilience. Um, at the outset of the conversation, I wanna mention three forces that are driving a lot of our work on climate res resilience here at the department. But before I do, I would be remiss if I did not also mention some of the work we're doing to drive down greenhouse gas emissions. As you know, the Biden administration has a very ambitious national goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 50 to 52% by 2030 and reaching net zero by 2050. We know we have our work cut out for us here. The transportation sector is the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, accounting for close to a, total of, to a third of our total emissions and one of the most challenging to decarbonize. 
And we know what's coming our way in terms of climate impacts if we don't meet this challenge. In fact, as you all know well, communities across the country are already facing extreme weather events that damage our infrastructure and cost large sums to repair, not to, not to mention the risk to people and communities. And I really appreciate all of the examples that were included in the, the Read Ahead primer on flood and sea level risk, uh, sea level rise risk to transportation infrastructures. So I don't have to go into all of those eye popping examples of what's at risk and what it's going to cost. But these events like coastal flooding, but also heat waves, wildfires, high winds are becoming more frequent as severe as the climate changes. And if we don't address the urgent need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, our work to increase the resilience of our communities will be that much harder, if not impossible in some places. So uh, we know that transportation policies and investments can be powerful catalysts that facilitate equitable and sustainable economic growth and resilient communities, as well as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, so I just had to get that out there at, at, at the outset, and uh, then I just wanted to talk about three things that are driving a lot of our activities here at the department around coastal resilience, and those are congressional direction, administration priorities, and stakeholder needs. So on the first one, congressional direction on resilience, we now have the bipartisan infrastructure law, also known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which I'll probably refer to as the bill. Sometimes we call it EJA or IJA here at the department. Um, and that was signed just over six months ago by President Biden. And so with its climate subtitle, which is the first infrastructure bill ever to include a climate subtitle and investments across the transportation modes, the bill can help to meet our climate goals, both on the greenhouse gas reduction and the resilience side. And it will create millions of good jobs, support investments in communities, such as laying new train tracks, rebuilding the roads and bridges in our communities, expanding transit, installing electric vehicle chargers, but as we make these significant investments in our transportation system and our communities, we have to do we, all that we can to ensure that resilience is at the forefront of those decisions related to planning, building, and operating our infrastructure. And then the second driver I wanted to mention of our activities is um, this administration's priorities related to climate resilience. So it's, this administration has been very clear that bolstering adaptation and increasing resilience to the impacts of climate change, including coastal resilience, is a top priority. The White House is leading a, a number of interagency working groups on resilience, including one on coastal resilience and one specifically focused on resilience to flooding, and DOT is actively participating in those groups. As required by Executive Order 14008, DOT has developed and publicly released a climate action plan for resilience. And I noticed that's also in the read ahead material, so thank you all for, for developing those and including that. Um, we did identify five priorities in our plan, including incorporating resilience into DOT grant making programs, enhancing resilience through project planning and development, and other priorities. And I'll, I think there was a link to the plan in those materials, and I'll try to touch on some of the things that we're doing to address those priorities at, at, at different points here during the webinar. But what drives us as just as much, if not more, is figuring out how we can better address the needs of our stakeholders in our communities. And, and this is the third thing I wanted to mention. So it's also why I'm really excited to be part of the webinar today to learn from our panel and the participants on how we can better support you all. DOT has been working closely with our stakeholders on resilience for well over a decade. For example, the Federal Highway Administration has worked with states and metropolitan areas to increase the longe longevity of the nation's infrastructure by assessing vulnerabilities and incorporating resilience throughout all phases of transportation decision making. This includes developing resources, providing technical assistance, funding pilot projects, and facilitating information exchange among transportation agencies. FHWA has partnered with over 50 resilience pilot project teams across the country, and all of that information and the resources that were developed are, are on our website, and I can make sure that folks have a, a link to, to the work of those 50 pilot projects. On the transit side, the Federal Transit Administration has developed a resilience benefit cost tool to assist transit agencies in considering resili resilience elements and capital improvement projects. The tool enables transit agencies to conduct a risk weighted cost benefit analysis for resilience projects being considered for funding. On the aviation side, FAA is leading an effort to develop an implementation plan for a national airport strategy to provide a top down framework for investments in airport infrastructure, including resilience. Uh, the Maritime Administration is developing an asset management tool for domestic port planning, and this tool would help assist public and private ports with establishing risk-based asset management plans to prioritize maintenance dollars and provide justification for spending scarce funding for maintenance and resilience priorities. So those are a few examples from the department of what we're doing. Uh, we know we need to do more, 
Um, in closing, I just want to say that there's no one solution, as we all know, for addressing transportation emissions and making our communities more resilient to climate change. It will require a collective commitment and a willingness to embrace a suite of innovative approaches. But webinars like this, bringing people together to talk about flood resilience is just invaluable for enhancing that collaboration and finding ways to help our communities prepare for the impacts of current and future disasters. So I'm really excited about this panel. Thank you so much for having me and really looking forward to hearing about the ideas from the other speakers and the folks that are participating on the webinar. Back to you, Jeff. Great, thank you, Heather. Uh, let's uh, turn the floor over to Jeremy. Thank you, and, and thank you for this opportunity to be here today. Um, to talk about what uh, California and Caltrans is doing in the, the space of um, reducing uh, coastal flood uh, risks and, uh, to our transportation infrastructure and, and just in general what we're doing with uh, climate change um, potential impacts. Uh, California is a big state um, and, and we have a lot of coordination that has to occur just within our own state. Um, it was mentioned in our intro that we have um, 12 different districts, and I'll be probably talking about that through our the presentation and discussion later today. But uh, six of those districts are on the Pacific Ocean, so they're directly um, challenged with uh, coastal uh, flooding and uh, risks from uh, sea level rise. And we also have a, a Delta region, which is also uh, has low-lying farmland and also habitats and highways that are susceptible to sea level rise, even though they're not right on the coast. So there, there's different considerations throughout our state. Um, <clears throat> Caltrans, um, in terms of trying to uh, look at the coastal flood uh, resilience, uh, we're looking at this in many ways. Um, the state overall is looking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which is uh, the more we can um, affect that, then, then the less that there will be um, risk to um, sea level rise and coastal flooding. So we have a goal to be at our 1990 levels by 2020, which was met, and our next goal is a 40% reduction of 1990 levels by 2030. And transportation is a big part of those emissions, so we are um, working to um, analyze our, our projects moving forward that have the potential to induce BMT um, and and look to mitigate those through our state um, NEPA equivalent, which is a uh, CEQA. And um, so this is a, a big area that we're looking at um, potentially reducing the potential increases in, in BMT, which results in more GHG. Um, and there's also, this is a cross-cutting effort, so it's not just Caltrans, obviously, there's um, lowering of the vehicle fleet in terms of its emissions per mile and many other efforts going on in the state. But overall, we are working to reduce the um, level of GHG emissions. Um, some other areas that we're working on, um, we're inventorying risks. We're using those inventories to inform scoping of projects. We're partnering at, um, on the identification of appropriate methods of analysis for um, coastal risks and sea level rise. And uh, for transportation projects, we're evaluating flood risks as part of the NEPA and permitting processes, including those with the, the Coastal Commission. For inventory of risks, we have completed vulnerability assessments for each of our 12 districts those vulnerability assessments are for all aspects of climate change, not just um, sea level rise or coastal flooding. Um, these are broad-based assessments. And um, off of those, we then had each of our districts then prepared adaptation priority reports. The purpose of those is to prioritize the order in which assets found to be exposed to climate hazards will undergo detailed asset level climate assessments. And we're getting into more detailed quarter assessments. And, and all of this is necessary because there are limited funds for uh, tackling these challenges. So we do need to really have a planned and prioritized uh, approach to how we tackle these challenges. Um, for partnering, we're, we're definitely working with many uh, partners throughout the state. 
Um, we have an Ocean Protection Council, which is um, leading some of our efforts um, across various agencies, um, creating uh, common methods and common language for moving ahead on our uh, efforts. Um, and of course, at Caltrans, we are working very closely with the California Coastal Commission, who we receive permits for, for our transportation projects and ensuring that their considerations are into our planning documents. Uh, and then on projects, we have uh, various guidance uh, documents out there for our staff across the state, um, including a sea level rise guidance, which um, provides considerations through each stage of the project development process um, related to sea level rise. And individual projects are going through risk uh, assessments and uh, modifying design as appropriate. Um, we, we've had a few projects that have uh, been able to successfully uh, reduce the risks and uh, Gleason Beach is, is one example that uh, recently got a Federal Highway Administration award for its um, efforts and it, it moved the, the highway inland and created a bridge to um, reduce risk where the um, sea level rise was resulting in er erosion and um, the, the bluff face was eroding. We we're doing uh, consistent maintenance at that location. And by moving the highway, we, we don't have those maintenance costs. And we're also um, set to be out of the uh, risk zone for, for quite some time. So um, there, there's many prongs to this. And I just look forward to the further discussion on this as, as we go through this uh, panel discussion today. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, next up, I'll turn it over to Kim. Thanks, Jeff. And thank you all for having me on here. It's a great honor. Um, so I work with the Southern Environmental Law Center. And for those of you who are not familiar, we are a, a not-for-profit um, environmental organization. We work in six states throughout the Southeast. And like Heather and Jeremy, of course, a lot of what we do is reducing uh, GHGs um, in our six states. The Southeast has a kind of disproportional impact on climate change in the United States. So we work in the transportation um, and energy sectors on, on that work, <clears throat> but we also do um, have a very heavy focus on resilience um, in part because we have some really special coastal areas in the southeastern United States. Um, so a lot of that work happens in Virginia and uh, in Georgia and then uh, South Carolina. And then my focus uh, is particularly in North Carolina. And when we're thinking about resilience, of course, in the Southeast, we have seen a lot of uh, hurricanes and more frequent major storms over the past few years. And so resilience isn't necessarily just on our coastline. Um, some of those hurricanes have impacts on our transportation system right the way through the state. Um, but there are very special considerations um, that we do apply to thinking about the coast. We've got some really unique areas of wildlife. We have National Wildlife Refuge, National Seashores, um, really special uh, coastal communities that have been there for generations and generations. And so there's just a, a very delicate balance um, that we have to think about those communities, that wildlife, about marsh migration, about what does the future um, hold and, and how can we invest in ways that it's going to create uh, really safe, um, long-term, long-lasting, secure transportation solutions and couple that with all of the wildlife and, and other sensitivities that we find on the coast. And so we do that um, through a variety of, of um, strategies, mostly at Southern Environmental Law Center, we are attorneys. And so our strategies are primarily legal. Um, I personally do um, a big mix of litigation. Um, I'm currently involved in a challenge to the North Carolina Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration um, for a a transportation project that's proposed um, 
to the North Carolina out of banks. And one of our key claims in that case is that the government is relying on such outdated projections of sea level rise that it's not really taking a thoughtful approach um, to coastal resilience. Um, so when we see bad projects, litigation is often the way that we ultimately have to go. Some, we have had settlements in uh, several of those cases where we've been able to bring parties to the table and try to come up with more long-term um, more resilient transportation solutions. But we also work in a range of other ways. We do uh, a lot of lobbying, trying to push for um, more spending on um, <clears throat> natural resilient infrastructure uh, and a lot more planning, um, really focusing on lobbying our governor and our local governments um, on how they can be really more thoughtfully planning, using the best science, and um, taking, taking a hard, maybe a new look um, at what is needed for the coast um, that maybe has changed in, in the past um, decade or so. Uh, we also lobby at our state legislature um, who have the, the purse strings and encourage them to invest in ways that is going to be more resilient. So lots of different strategies. Um, and when we can, you know, we love working alongside those coastal communities. One of my big projects over the past year has been working with a range of um, state, federal, and local entities on what does a long-term solution look for um, Highway NC-12, which is the highway that runs along the North Carolina out of banks. And how can we all come to the table to think about solutions that um, work for everyone, work for the communities, work for the wildlife, and, and that are fundable. Um, so we appreciate all these new ideas and funding coming down from the Biden administration and just now are really focused on how we can make the best use of them. Great, thank you, Kim. Well, I think that gives everyone a, a really good introduction to the work uh, that uh, our panelists have been doing and some of the issues that are uh, coming up in the, the whole uh, rollout of the uh, Infrastructure Act. I wanna thank each of the panelists right now, but uh, in the second part of the webinar, uh, what we'd like to do is uh, pose some questions uh, to the panel uh, each person will get a chance to respond to each question, but this is intended to be a time for sort of open discussion. Um, and so let me start with uh, just a first kind of pretty easy question. Uh, everyone, I think, has been really interested in uh, the Infrastructure Act and its implementation, and it is a major boost for uh, transportation infrastructure funding. Um, are there measures that are now uh, underway or are under development to improve the climate and coastal resilience of these new investments? Um, several of you have spoken to this in your presentation, but uh, because it's such an important topic, I just wanted to give each of you a chance to uh, expand on any thoughts about uh, how to perfect the climate uh, resilience elements of the infrastructure bill or, or any new ideas you may have that you didn't get a chance to mention in the opening. Maybe if we start with Heather. Sure, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, we um, we are really excited about the, the bill, as I'll call it, for Infrastructure Act. Um, we, you know, we, there are a lot of new authorities on climate resilience. We have our first legislative definition of resilience in the bill. Um, that's really exciting. And we also have our very first dedicated funding program to resilience, the Promoting Resilient Operations for Transformative, Efficient, and Cost-Saving Transportation Program, PROTECT. So I'll never say that again. I'll just call it PROTECT. And I have to read it because I'll never remember what that PROTECT stands for. But we have $7.3 billion in formula funding to states and $1.4 billion in competitive grants over five years to increase the resilience of our transportation system. And um, before I came to the office of the secretary, I worked at the Federal Highway Administration on their sustainable transportation resilience team for about 10 years. And 
And we did a lot of work with state DOTs and others to try to understand vulnerabilities and assess those and figure out what's at risk. But we always ran into the challenge that there's just not enough money. There's no specific dedicated money to, to invest in those adaptation solutions once, once they've been de de determined. So, so now we have some funding. It's still not going to be enough, but it's, it's, a, it's a good uh, down payment. And it includes funding for evacuation routes, the coastal resilience concerns, um, efforts to move infrastructure to nearby locations that aren't impacted as much by extreme weather and natural disasters. So it's very exciting. Um, the Federal Highway Administration is administering that program and they're working on finalizing the guidance for at least the, um, the formula program. There are two pieces, as I mentioned, discretionary and, and formula. Um, so we're expecting that guidance will be coming out soon. The other thing I want to mention is that the bill does prioritize natural infrastructure as a resilient solution. So it also has a definition of natural infrastructure. Uh, and it expands opportunities to utilize funding for natural infrastructure within PROTECT, the new PROTECT program, um, and also leveraging existing natural environment to help us achieve greater resilience in projects like tidal wetlands and um, that help to protect our infrastructure from flooding, but also help reduce carbon emissions in the first place. And the bill also formally incorporates resilience into many existing transportation programs. So considerations in some of our, our traditional funding programs, such as the National Highway Performance Program, uh, the Surface Transportation Block Pro Grant Program, and uh, Federal Highways Emergency Relief Program. So that's exciting. Um, uh, one other thing to mention, we do have, uh, we, the bill authorizes the creation of new resilience and adaptation centers of excellence. So there's envisioned to be 10 of those centers regionally across the country and then one national center to help advance research on transportation infrastructure resilience. We don't actually have funding for that yet, but we're optimistic we'll be getting that in FY23. Um, so I'd say that the question about implementation, I think you know one of the keys to implementing these new programs and authorities is coordination. So coordination across these new programs, existing programs, and then better coordination with our stakeholders and communities. But I'm also really interested to hear from the other panelists on, on how we can effectively implement a lot of these new and exciting programs. Back to you, Jeff. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Jeremy, thoughts on, on the general question about the Infrastructure Act? Thanks, Jeff. And yeah, I agree with Heather in terms of the need for coordination as these uh, programs roll out and, and identifying um, the the rules and then how uh, you know states can apply for grants and, and ensuring that the states have a voice in terms of how to apply for and, and best um, uh, develop those programs. Um, and Heather also mentioned about the the gap in funding, um, and that's why there needs to be a well thought out planning and prioritization uh, of these resources. Um, the the level of resources is great to have something finally and, and have it so prominent. Uh, 1.4 billion is a, a substantial amount of money and investment, and so we're really appreciative of that. Um, in our state highway system management plan, we've estimated for California we need 9 to 11 billion by 2030 and by 2100 to uh, maybe up to 45 billion. So just the scale of the the situation is is very um, high magnitude compared to where the funding is now. So hopefully we can show some some uh, successes with the funding we're getting here and and be able to build off of this. Um, and and what I just mentioned there in terms of the um, the cost is is the highway system and um, there's hundreds of billions of dollars on our local systems that are also at risk um, in terms of properties and um, and, and transportation assets for our, our local partners. So there's a, a huge need out there and that really gets to the need for prioritization and planning. Um, resilient planning should be factored into our investment decisions and resources allocated appropriately um, based on that. Um, the more we can have some dedicated funding to planning and, and resources for planning, um, that is, would be very helpful. Um, so, and perhaps those could be scaled back at later times, but at the present point, um, having planning resources so we can have a, a plan moving forward in terms of how we prioritize the, the dollars that are there. Because as I mentioned, there's there's a pretty substantial gap there. So 
um, if, if we are able to um, take a comprehensive look and, and have the resources to take those comprehensive looks, then we can make the right kind of prioritizations and um, make the right kind of investment um, decisions. Um, right now at present, many of our projects move forward because there's an emergency situation and perhaps a sea, a sea wall or, or some kind of temporary um, fix is put into place. Those can have impacts that are um, detrimental. Um, so the, the more that we're able to plan things out and, and maybe have the funds um, to be able to have more long-term uh, solutions, the, the better um, because the a, a dollar spent um, for the, the long-term uh, investment may have a, a multiplier effect in terms of how many dollars are, are saved um, over the long term. <clears throat> and then just one more thing I wanted to mention here was in addition to investing into the planning and prioritization is um, uh, science investment and um, that will help inform those planning and policies um, comparing costs of nature-based versus uh, conventional flood protection strategies, um, being able to consider coastal and at atmospheric processes in our um, analyses, and then um, being able to support uh, new technologies, um, such as monitoring uh, flood risks over time. <clears throat> and uh, a current example of a research project that is doing um, some of the interdisciplinary work um, is the NOAA National Center for Coastal Ocean Science, um, which has got the exploring ecosystem and community vulnerability to surface and subsurface flooding with sea level rise and adaptation strategies in California and the Humboldt Bay. And we probably need more of these type of research projects to evaluate how different project designs could um, affect localized flooding. So some of my thoughts there on, on that one, thanks. Great, thanks, Jeremy. And uh, let Kim take a shot at it. Sure, and I'll start by echoing Jeremy. I think we really want to see um, more help from the federal government on the planning side. And if that doesn't happen, uh, I think, you know, we have a little concerns and sort of remains to be seen how this money um, actually gets spent. Um, we appreciate these new definitions of resilient infrastructure and um, sorry, of resilience and natural infrastructure. And, you know, that leads to possibilities for really great new ideas of things that can be funded. But what we've seen in the past is um, first what Jeremy was talking about, where um, we just end up building the same things uh, in the same place over and over again after an emergency and not really a sort of long term uh, planning approach, because um, we know where a lot of these breaches are going to be, uh, but we end up waiting for an emergency and then just sort of patching things up. Um, so we want to get away from that. The other concern that we have um, often in the Southeast, this idea of a hurricane evacuation route is used to justify projects which are really more about, um, you know, shoveling people to the beach faster, economic development. Um, and they slap this label of hurricane evacuation on there in order to, you know, qualify for some federal funding. And there's been a lot of back and forth on a number of projects I've worked on with um, federal permitting agencies saying, actually, this isn't gonna help uh, hurricane evacuation because you're putting more people out there in, in danger in the first place. So we are concerned about um, state, some of the states in our region using some of this money to just fund projects which have maybe on the, been on the books for decades and decades and a not great um, coastal resilient projects, but kind of, you know, packaging them up um, to, to, to fit into definitions. So to get away from that, we'd, we'd really like to see that there's um, some good oversight from the, the, the federal government on how these uh, funds can be spent, um, as well as that help with the planning so that we can start 
thinking, you know, today's projections of, of sea level rise, of the frequency of storms and hurricanes, everything is very different than it looked even 10 years ago. And so projects which were uh, a good idea 30 years ago um, really probably aren't going to be today. And so, you know, starting from a little bit more of a blank slate and thinking really carefully about what can we do, what are the best decisions to be made rather than using money to justify old decisions is, is what we're really focused on. Great, that's very helpful. Um, let's turn to a uh, uh, another question here. Um, there are some existing programs that speak to climate and flood resilience of infrastructure projects, not just for transportation, but across the board, um, such as the National Environmental Policy Act uh, and the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard. Um, are these measures being effectively implemented in the transportation area? And how might that be improved? Um, maybe if we start with Jeremy on that. Sorry about that, I was on, on, on mute. So you were asking about the, the NEPA question. Um, yes, yeah, so um, but NEPA is something that will evolve over time. Um, we saw that with the last administration and some things that are are changing with respect to, to NEPA. Um, we we anticipate more changes to be coming. Um, where where NEPA affects how the projects move forward is um, it it requires us to consider avoiding, minimizing, and mitigating impacts. So for coastal floodplain risks, this means reducing exposure to a hazard. Um, so it sea level rise should be fully considered in our alternatives consideration and our resource impact avoidance. Um, NEPA tends to result in modifications to projects through consideration of those alternatives and minimization measures. But right now, at least, the, the scope of the project is, is driven mostly by the asset. Um, so if it's a culvert, you know, does the culvert need to be fixed? Um, we're, we're looking to to replace a culvert or a bridge. Um, and then NEPA is a layer that gets then added to that for consideration um, in terms of, okay, what alternatives do we have to that bridge replacement? What, what ways can we minimize the effect? Um, and, but hopefully over time, in addition to NEPA, we can integrate sea level rise considerations into our asset management considerations for how we design our system in, in general. So it's, it's not just from a NEPA standpoint, but but looking at the, the assets through how we actually plan our projects. Um, logical term and I may also come into uh, play with this, which is a, a, a NEPA concept, as well as um, independent utility. Um, when, when you look at just a, an individual asset, you may, um, you may not come up with the same kind of solutions as if you look at a corridor approach um, where and logical term and I may may lead you down that path of um, where where do we really need to uh, look at beginning and end, ending a project because if you can build a bridge above the floodplain but if that touches down at locations that are still inundated with floods then you, you have, you've created a bridge to nowhere so um, so we need to, to have that corridor approach and, and, and not just look in a, in a confined box so when we're looking at these things. Um, floodplain risk, we, we definitely do try to design our projects and, and assets outside of um, areas that are susceptible to floodplain. Um, important in that is, is making sure that whatever that base information is updated and um, consistent with the most recent risks and information. So whether it's um, uh, national flood insurance maps or other products developed by uh, FEMA, such as uh, flood insurance rate maps, um, those being up to current uh, standards and, and up to date and, and taking into account uh, the risks that might be out there, that's all important as we um, make those determinations um, for for uh, impacts 
uh, for federal flood risk management and, and also how floodplains is also considered through the NEPA process. So um, just having the best available data and science as we make those decisions through those processes is important. Thank you. Great, thanks, uh, Kim. Yeah, echo a lot of what Jeremy would say. I mean, at base, NEPA should be an absolutely wonderful tool for this type of decision making. I mean, what NEPA says you have to do is first that the government's got to take a really careful, thoughtful look um, at a project and it's got to disclose all of that information to the public. Um, like Jeremy says, you've got to use up to date, um, really good science, and you've got to look at these alternative solutions. So used well and early in the process, um, this, this should be a great opportunity to say, okay, this is an option. These are the <clears throat> foreseeable consequences we're gonna see um, down the line here with, with sea level rise or more frequent storms or whatever it is. And here are some alternative solutions. And, and here's the cost, all of that to communities, to the environment um, and fiscally. And if that's done well, that should be an absolutely fantastic um, tool. Unfortunately, what we see is it's not always done well. Um, those are um, some of the cases that I've been engaged in litigating. Uh, as I mentioned, we're currently engaged in a NEPA litigation on a uh, coastal bridge project where, you know, really old data has been used and alternatives haven't really been examined. And so that, that those are the types of cases that end up in court. Um, but it, it is a great tool. I think we are going to see more changes um, from the Biden administration. There's the, the phase two uh, B regulations um, expected <clears throat> to come out uh, later this summer. And, you know, hopefully they might speak to these issues with a little more clarity. Uh, one concern I will raise, I think it was in MAP 21 or maybe the FAST Act, uh, created some, some exemptions or lower levels of NEPA for areas where bridges were essentially replaced in the same place. And um, you also get a similar um, <clears throat> exemption from some of these planning requirements when there are these real extreme emergency situations and emergency funding, and you're often exempted from these planning um, requirements like NEPA. And so what that does is incentivize building the same project in the same place, um, which is obviously really the opposite of what we're trying to do. So that's just a little flag that I would love to see changed um, in regulations going forward. But yeah, in theory, this is, is a great tool and should be embraced by um, state DOTs and the Federal Highway Administration as a way to get everyone on the same page about what is a good long-term solution. Great, thank you. Uh, so we've mostly talked now about um, some of the things that are, are good news and things that are going well. Um, and I really wanted to give you a chance to maybe talk to some, look at the other side of the equation. Are there things that uh, aren't going so well or need to be fixed that we could do better? Um, for example, um, there's a concern with coastal flood resilience programs generally uh, that often the program benefits flow to wealthy people rather than disadvantaged communities. And I know the administration's been very committed to equity and social justice, um, but I wonder if there are uh, ideas that you all have or things that you're thinking about doing uh, that speak to uh, this social justice opportunity or, or any other uh, aspect of something that isn't maybe hasn't gone as well as it could, but could be better. And I think in the rotation here, we're going to start with Kim this time. Yeah, so I think, I mean, one way when we think about this is thinking about um, relocations of communities and communities which are, you know, maybe living in floodplains. These, when we look at Eastern North Carolina, we see these communities who are just getting hit 
over and over again um, <clears throat> by hurricanes, um, maybe directly their properties, or we're seeing um, CAFOs overflowing with um, sewage around these same communities. Uh, they're just being hit um, by these cumulative effects of, of all of these natural disasters. Um, and so, you know, it can be quite tempting to, to think like, well, maybe we, you know, these communities need to relocate, but at the same time, we want to be very thoughtful about keeping um, these communities whole and, and the importance of the, them as a community themselves. Um, <clears throat> so I know one idea that's been floated and um, started to uh, look at in South Carolina some as some funds um, to be set up um, to help uh, with relocations and so communities can be kept um, whole together. Uh, I think another really important piece of this is more public participation in these planning decisions so that we're actually listening to communities and what is going to be most helpful for them. I know that's something um, that the Biden administration has, has put a lot of um, focus on. Um, and then, you know, we also see these trade-offs uh, often at the beach where are we protecting <clears throat> million dollar beach homes at the, expect, uh, at the expense of um, projects, you know, further down, further down the coast. Um, and we know that that has happened in the past when we're putting in groins and other other things like that. So it's really tricky um, because there are, you know, our coast is changing, our coastal plain is changing. Uh, some of these areas that are most at risk are obviously the, the cheapest land and often end up being communities that already are um, really disadvantaged on a number of levels. Um, so, being inclusive, listening, um, creating good uh, community dialogue, I think is is the next is, is a really important step. But I don't think there's an easy answer to this situation. Heather, do you have thoughts on the, um, either the social justice or or something we could do better kind of question? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Kim. It's it's a really challenging um, dilemma, uh, and and as she indicated, the Biden administration is really focused on equity and environmental justice issues. Um, you know, as we're working on implementation of the bill, we've developed internally interim guidance to help provide clarity on some of our discretionary grant programs and decision making, so that um, those programs, the criteria includes. Uh, the programs include criteria on climate change, resilience, and racial equity, and our, our Justice 40 goals, um, so that we are, are paying close attention to that and trying to strike a balance uh, when looking across those criteria, so that we aren't um, just funding those same communities um, or the you know the more wealthy communities that are applying for these grants. And and the other piece of that that we're we're trying to do is to find ways to better um, support communities that might be applying for some of these new grant opportunities and the funding because we know. Um, in many cases, um, some communities just do not have the capacity to to successfully apply for these grants um, and be successful in, in, in actually realizing them. So that's one thing that we're looking to try to help build um, the ca capacity and capability of folks um, at the local government level, especially as we're looking to implement the bill. So, uh, but it's 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 absolutely a challenge, and certainly recognize the you know the the issues brought up about. Um, climate refugees that, you know, we actually are already seeing in our, you know, there are folks within our country that are already having to, as Kim said, you know, move away from the coast and, and how are we going to manage that? You know, it's, it's, it's still a bit of a taboo subject, the issue of managed retreat, but it's, it's one of my colleagues mentioned recently, if we don't have managed retreat, we're going to have un, unmanaged retreat, which we may already be having, having. So it's an important conversation to start having in earnest these days. As, as, um, as Kim said, things are not even like they we thought they would be, you know, 10 years ago, things were changing so quickly. Great, thanks. Go ahead, Jeremy. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, Heather, and we're, we're doing some of that as well in terms of our grant programs, ensuring that they're equitably 
spread out to all communities um, with special focus on those uh, more vulnerable communities. Um, our 2020 to 2024 strategic plan um, does include a goal for leading climate action and um, we have uh, made a commitment to ensure that those strategies for climate action program will uh, work with the most uh, vulnerable communities to increase resiliency uh, in those communities. Um, and at the state level, um, our state has released a climate adaptation strategy, which also recognizes that some of the communities um, that are facing these com compounding vulnerabilities and they um, experience disproportionate impacts, um, particularly in low income and rural communities, communities of color and, and tribal nations. So um, it's definitely a, an overall focus in our state is um, ensuring that these communities are not bearing the disproportionate impacts and, and how do we um, consider that in, in all the um, decisions that we're making. Um, and in many cases, they don't have the, uh, and I think this was uh, mentioned by uh, Kim and, and Heather as well, as these communities don't have the ability to uh, adapt and less capacity and resources to cope with and adapt to the climate um, impacts. So um, I, I think, you know, having the ability to um, ensure that they are um, getting the resources and, and getting a fair amount of the, the grants and other um, opportunities that are available is, is very important and is something that we're incorporating into our uh, planning. Um, we're also developing a transportation equity index um, to inform and shape investments in underserved communities. So that's another um, area that we've uh, worked toward and maybe a more specific one um, with relation to what I was just talking about. Um, and uh, just overall, we're we're trying to address the community needs, and uh, there's you know the needs are going to vary by location, so we need to really just have those conversations and and look at each situation and um, and, and work through the process and try to utilize the available funding sources to the the best. Um, of our abilities to, to address these, but it's, it's definitely a difficult problem um, where there's where there's a lack of uh, funding in a community, and maybe that's where some of the the impacts are are hitting hard. Um, and, and that's where it is exciting to have some of these new um, funding programs and and opportunities that maybe can provide some more funding in the, in these critical areas. But um, like we've all talked about the um, there needs to be a lot of planning and, and um, uh, review to to identify those, inventory those, and um, and then help try to direct funding where necessary um, to those. Great, thanks. Thanks. So I, I think we have time for one more kind of round robin question before we go to audience questions. Um, and I, I'd like uh, to hear your thoughts on the general uh, problem of uh, doing good transportation planning for coastal resilience uh, at the same time coordinating that with the resilience planning that is going on uh, to protect other assets, other infrastructure assets, not transportation, whether it's energy assets, water, or even defense assets. Um, and of course, there's there are ecosystems, beaches, and wetlands uh, that other agencies are worried about as storms and sea level rise get worse. Um, and of course, um, communities are are looking to protect or relocate. And so, um, all of those things to work well, they kind of need to be coordinated. And building the mechanisms for that kind of cross uh, sector cooperation can be a challenge. Uh, and I wonder what your thoughts are on um, how we can strengthen that kind of cooperation uh, on a multi sector basis, maybe starting with Heather. Did you say Heather or Kim? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, Heather. Okay, sorry, just to make sure. Um, yeah, Jeff, that. I mean, to me, that's one of the 
the biggest challenges we have right now. You know, the and there are a lot of there are some opportunities. So we have already within the overall transportation planning process, we have um, a requirement to incorporate resilience as a as a planning factor. And I've always, you know, felt that the transportation planning process, especially as it's done, you know, at some of the the MPOs and the collaboration that ha happens with the states, that that's where a lot of this um, sort of broader planning can happen. And as as this, you know, the transportation agencies are in many cases required to bring in other stakeholders from other sectors to have those kinds of planning conversations. And now, now we have um, with the Protect program another. Uh, sort of level of planning that um, has been introduced with the resilient improvement plans. Um, unfortunately, I think they're calling them RIPs at this moment. I'm hoping that like that might change. <laughs> they just have some unfortunate acronyms coming out of this, um, the the bill. But um, but you know, there's another opportunity there to provide um, a mechanism for additional coordination across different sector planning um, opportunities. So I think so. There's there's that, but. It always has been such a challenge, and over the you know the years I worked um, when I was at the Federal Highway Administration, we did a lot of pilot projects, and I and I, I'm a huge fan of pilot projects. And one of the big reasons is because when we were able to do that, we we brought together these different sectors. So we would have a state DOT and an MPO, and we would have the local academics, and we would have local governments, and we would have other stakeholders that would come together to work on these projects. And in many cases, those groups hadn't actually come together. I've always sort of thought of climate resilience as one of those um, those issues that brings people together for better or for worse. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity, but it's but it's really challenging. And I think um, the planning process and now with the introduction of the new uh, resilience improvement plans, um, there's a, there's a great opportunity there to do a better job of integrating these considerations across sectors. But it it is challenging. I know we're siloed in the federal government, we're siloed at the state government, we're even siloed, you know, in, in our communities. And so I think the challenge is real. But I think, um, again, that this topic has a lot of opportunity to bring people together because people are, um, they, they see it, they feel it, they understand the importance. And then I think that helps us to break down those, those silos that often exist in our, in our interactions at, um, you know, local, state, federal governments. Back to you, Jeff. Go to Jeremy on that one. Thanks, and yeah, I can uh, certainly uh, think about the ways we're we're siloed. Even even within our own department, we have twenty thousand employees, and many of them are working on on aspects of sea level rise and and coastal flooding in different ways, and, and just even trying to get our own um, department all working in concert is, is a big challenge. And then when you expand that to the, the bigger universe of other um, local governments uh, and, and regional governments, it, it's a big challenge for sure. Um, and there are finite public resources to address all of these challenges. And um, I, I think I've touched on this many times, but just the more we can insert planning and prioritization, avoiding hazards um, will reduce the total and overall long-term costs and, and maximize our value of our public investments. So um, we, we are trying to do more corridor planning. Um, and, and really, this is so important. I, I mentioned this a little bit before in terms of you might be able to raise the, the bridge out of the, the risk area, but you need to make sure that the other assets around it are also being considered. And then that gets that much more challenging when you're dealing with local governments and what are their plans? Um, are they are they planning on, on building their local roadways and their, their sewer and their trunk lines and all these um, water connections? Are they going to build those in a resilient fashion? Are we, are we doing managed retreat? Um, is the whole community on board with the, the same philosophy there in terms of we're doing managed retreat or are we um, uh, coming up with some other solutions in a location? So um, it's very complex and it, it really needs a lot of work from a lot of people to, to come together and, and come up with these plans um, because uh, otherwise, yeah, we're, we're um, maybe going to be paying more for it later uh, with um, unmanaged retreat. <laughs> I like that that term. So, um, yeah, just the, the more that we can focus uh, planning resources and, and corridor approaches and, and have the, 
the focus to to bring people together early to to make these um, decisions and prioritizations. So we're we're all on the same page moving forward is is very important. Now, turn it to Kim. Yeah, I think it's a real challenge. It's obviously so important, um, as Jeremy and Heather have said. Um, there's so many structures in place for how transportation decisions get made already um, at federal, state, local levels that can sometimes get in the way of some of this coordination. I mean, outside of the resilience area, one of the things I focus on a lot is, can, you know, can we have better coordination between transportation and land use planning generally so that we can have uh, <clears throat> more dense connected cities with more transit and even just getting that done is, is challenging enough. Um, because in North Carolina and Virginia, for example, we have uh, the way that we pick which transportation projects to fund is through a, a data-driven process. And that makes a lot of sense to kind of take the politics out of selecting transportation projects. Um, but the problem with those types of processes mean that it then does become kind of harder to go through these holistic planning exercises um, with a variety of, of different stakeholders. Um, so it, it might mean that we're going to have to rethink some of the ways that we have planned and prioritized transportation systems in the past. Um, we, nationally, we have this MPO level system of, of picking projects, and then they kind of work their way um, up through state transportation plans. Um, Again, not that we don't want local voices engaged, but maybe we need to be rethinking exactly how we're including local voices um, for these types of decisions and how can we be better coordinating. The NEPA process comes to mind again as a great place for that type of coordination, but often that's happening, you know, once we've already decided on the type of project or the type of area where we want a project to be built. So I do think it's it is a real challenge. Um, it's something that you know hopefully could be led by a um, a strong um, governor or some strong leadership from the federal government. Um, but it's gonna require the the dismantling or at least relaxation of of some of their really rigid systems we have in place right now. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we've we've sort of covered the sort of general questions that we wanted to share with everyone, and now we want to turn to audience questions uh, for the final part of the webinar. So, uh, anyone in the audience, if you have a question, please uh, go to the Q and A function and share it with us, and we will try and forward it on here uh, to the panelists. It, it this will be up to a panelist, whether you want to take on uh, one of these questions or not, uh, we won't try and do the round robin thing at this point. Um, but why don't we start with the first one? And so there's a question. Um, when considering infrastructure such as roads and bridges, uh, what do you and your engineering teams consider to be an acceptable frequency of high tide flooding? Uh, and do you perform any statistical inundation analysis to determine a specific elevation or flood frequency threshold for these types of projects? Um, Jer Jeremy might uh, be best to, to answer this one, but I'll just throw in that from um, the Federal Highway Administration has um, guidance on addressing climate risk in both the coastal riverine um, environment and some technical guidance that includes uh, information on how to do some of those assessments. I think it varies by state and by location in terms of the specifics of what you're looking at, but um, but there's some really good uh, guidance in those documents and I can put those either in the chat or, or send them to Jeff if folks are interested in taking a look at those. Um, they're called hydraulic engineering circulars, number 17 and uh, number 25. <laughs> But I'm not an engineer, so I'm not the best one to explain what's in those. Um, and then I would also say that another good place to look for some information and resources, um, the Federal Highway Administration developed a nature-based solutions for coastal highway resilience implementation guide. 
And that also has some really good information on how to think about um, considering climate resilience and, and designing um, transportation infrastructure. Yeah, and I, I'm, I don't have the specific information on, on that. I think that would probably be something that would be in our highway design manual. Um, if, if there is such a reference, uh, we, we certainly um, try to reduce the potential for any kind of uh, flood risk and, and inundation on our, our roadways. So, but I don't know that there's a specific um, frequency that's that's allowed. I, I know we look at um, certain um, risk scenarios for sea level rise and, and try to design above those levels. Um, but in terms of uh, frequency of inundation, I would I would have to look that up or or check into that more. Yeah, the only thing I'd add, I remember going to a presentation from um, folks from the Netherlands a, a little while ago and just thinking about the switch from <clears throat> what is an acceptable frequency rather than like we want zero flooding. Um, maybe having to get to that point of like, you know, picking that number because zero flooding is maybe something that we just can't strive for anymore. And so being a little bit more upfront about that in, in certain areas, um, <clears throat> what that looks like, again, needs to really be dependent on a realistic assessment of the science in the future. And um, if I could just add one one thing that I'm really excited about here at the department, we're we're um, embarking on a new partnership with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration (NOAA) um, to do uh, a little bit more in terms of providing tools using the new information that they've just released on uh, sea level rise and and tailoring it a bit more to the transportation community, um, and also working with them on climate education to reach a lot of our internal folks who are, need to start thinking about more about. Um, climate resilience in their daily work, um, and then we're hoping we can also expand it out to some of our, our stakeholders to make it available. So we're, we're really excited about that because we know that there's um, a lot more that we could do to provide the kind of information and resources and tools for our stakeholders to, to, to do these kinds of analyses going forward. Great, thanks. Um, another question here. Uh, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think it's worth coming back to. Um, the questioner writes, uh, two areas of interest to me are coastal resilience with climate change and moving toward a carbon-free transportation network. One area these two interests seemingly conflict is when mass evacuation is required from a coastal area due to a tropical storm or natural disaster. Having been in one of these before, I can attest how bad traffic was due to congestion around gas stations. How are states and the, or the federal government planning for this scenario when tens or hundreds of thousands of electric vehicles go in the same direction at once under less than ideal conditions? Who would like to? Go ahead, Heather. Yeah. I was just saying it is it's a great question. And we and we are we are thinking about that. Um we um through our electric vehicle deployment um grants and um some of the guidance around that, we're starting to think about how to best do that. And one question that continues to come up is the siting of these this new electric vehicle infrastructure and making sure that it, it is placed in um you know the the appropriate places and considerations of things like evacuations um, in, in terms of hurricanes. You also, you know, in Virginia had an unfortunate situation wasn't coastal, but of um, uh, when, in the last winter when this, the snow was so bad that we, people got stuck on Interstate 95, which again, the electric vehicle question came up as well. So all of these sort of situations that we need to think more about as we start to deploy that infrastructure. So um, so that is something that at the department we're, we're definitely thinking through and, and I'm sure a lot of the, the states are as well as they're they're starting to figure out where to site the, the new electric vehicle infrastructure. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll, I don't have all the answers, but it's certainly something I hear come up a lot um, in North Carolina talking about the transition to electric vehicles is, is what does that look like in a hurricane? I mean, I think there are some, some beneficial things, like when we think about electric trucks that can actually store a lot of, of um, power. And as we start to see uh, batteries get better and better, um, this can start to be a solution rather than, than, a, than a problem. Um, but I, I don't know there's great answers right now. I think the one thing might be a little bit of a change in policy and that we often get a fair warning of, of time to evacuate, um, but there are always folks who kind of, you know, want to leave that to the last minute or there can be coastal um, policies to like keep folks at the beach as long as possible to keep spending those tourism dollars. And maybe we need to be thinking about um, using our, our forecasts of hurricanes um, a little more judi judiciously to, to get folks out a little earlier as we switch to more electric vehicles. Yeah, and we're, um, we're, we're looking at uh, emergency evacuation as well, um, evacuation routes, not just for flooding, but also fire. Fire is big here in California, so um, being able to have uh, capacity on our roadways to ensure that um, vehicles are able to escape in a, a fire situation as well as a flood situation, um, having the right warning systems in place, um, being able to alert people. Um, we do have tsunami uh, risk as well on the coast. Um, and so we do have some design guidance that's out there that, that discusses many of the different um, considerations like uh, planning and route development and um, ensuring roadways are able to handle the, the flow of traffic in the high risk areas. Um, and uh, the, the electric vehicle one's an interesting twist or addition to that. And I, I think adding infrastructure certainly helps, but there's also the consideration of the, the timing of, of refueling, I guess, would be a, a concern. So. Um, I, I don't know that we've got into that too much, but we are definitely working to build up the, the um, recharge infrastructure in California. Great. Uh, so another question, uh, this is coming, uh, asking, I guess, for a little more detail on this question of, uh, of the future risks. Uh, how how are you addressing the issue of incorporating future rainfall and sea level rise conditions into road design? In my state, transportation engineers are frequently using historical rainfall flooding data. Yeah, I, I saw Heather maybe wanted to jump in there, but I'll, I'll just say a few words. Um, I think I touched on that a little bit in terms of the research end of it and, and trying to um, get some good research and information in terms of what those future weather patterns are and then trying to get that um, recognized across the, the different divisions and, and people that are working on this. Um, but I, I do think that many are still using historical data because that's tried and true to information that, that is often reference and utilize for, for design. Yeah, I'll just add, um, you know, that a lot of the, the um, engineers will, will use, um, for example, Atlas 14 data, which is historical in nature for rainfall. Um, but there are a lot of conversations happening right now about um, moving forward with efforts to incorporate um, future conditions projections into that data set. So we're optimistic that that's coming, but it's um, it may take some time, but we there's definitely a recognition of the need to, to do more in terms of providing um, better data for folks to use, especially on the, on the rainfall side, but but it, across the board, I think it's true too for other stressors. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is, you know, this can be a, a political problem. We saw in North Carolina a few years ago where essentially, um, you know, projections of future sea level rise were banned from being incorporated into analyses. Um, and, and that's really unfortunate. So um, 
education is always key to these things. I think folks are getting uh, <clears throat> a little more um, realistic about the future. And I think unfortunately, some of the extreme weather that we have seen has prompted um, us to take this a little bit more seriously. Um, but, but generally I would say, you know, <clears throat> for, for, from the advocacy side, the more we can be advocating for um, the most up-to-date science and, and really educating at all levels of government about that, um, the better we're gonna be. Okay, here, here's a question that, that kind of comes back to the mechanics of the delivery of the uh, infrastructure money. Um, the question is uh, new resilient spending from uh, IIJA infrastructure bill will commonly flow through states and follow local county city design or decisions, including existing lists of priority projects that were not designed for resilience. How can the federal to local administration of spending be improved to ensure that resilience is integrated into this, these new IIJA projects as the legislation intends. Maybe start with Heather on that. Yeah, it's a great question. And there's absolutely a recognition across the department of the need to, um, to, um, to, address, to address it. Um, you know, when it comes to our discretionary grant programs, as I mentioned, we have incorporated climate resilience as a, as a criteria. And so as we're looking at um, making decisions on those discretionary grant programs, um, we are, are looking explicitly at those um, <clears throat> considerations on, on resilience. And so that's not just um, the PROTECT program, which of course is dedicated to resilience, but also um, across the board as we can as allowable by statute we have incorporated climate resilience into the notices of funding opportunities for our grants that are administered by ost by all the other the modes to the extent that we can so we're so we're doing what we can on that front um, it's a bit trickier when it comes to um our formula funds because those are um distributed to the states and the states make the decisions about how to spend those um, we're looking to you know we provided some guidance um, just generally on, on how to, uh, we hope the states will spend those funds and we're looking to do more in terms of providing additional guidance and tools and resources to make those decisions easier to do, to incorporate resilience, for example. Uh, but it is, it will, it is a challenge and it's, it's something that we're, we're closely talking about and thinking about um, within the department, for sure. Jeremy, I can jump in just a little bit in terms of, I think there's a, a challenge with the timing of this sometimes where projects are already moving along in the, the system. And so, um, you know, some of the projects that have already been identified for uh, funding, you know, subjecting them to new requirements can be uh, a challenge for, for Caltrans or, or partners. Um, to, to change uh, how things are funded, but definitely on projects moving forward, um, we are trying to, and, and hopefully the new guidance and guidelines provide some um, requirements around that that make it clear how um, these considerations will be considered in, into uh, funding programs. And we are, like I said, trying to incorporate these considerations into our um, decision-making in terms of how we prioritize projects within Caltrans. Yeah, I mean, I think I flagged some of this in my opening remarks. It's definitely something when we look at the um, the non-discretionary funds um, that we are really, really concerned about. The only thing I would add that I think is helpful for us is from the advocacy side is the more the federal government can put out that guidance, put out that information. Those are all tools that we can use to advocate for at the state state and local level and say like, look, this is what this money is really supposed to be used for. Um, but but I do think it's it's a big, a big challenge. Great, thanks. Um, I think we have time for, for one more audience question here. Um, and there is a question that kind of follows up on Jeremy's mentioned corridor planning uh, a couple of times. Uh, it seems 
the corridor planning is important to identifying solutions to solve transportation problems, yet the planning process can be disconnected from agencies that regulate natural resources toward the end of the process when planning decisions have already been made and money has already been allocated or spent. How can we better integrate the corridor planning NEPA process and regulations of protected natural resources so that a proposal will be more successfully received when submitted for permitting? I, I would say early and often coordination um, is, is a key for that. Um, we have a permitting task force in our state that involves many of our state permitting agencies and our uh, transportation department to um, help effectuate that in California to try to have that early coordination and a framework for that and also bring in our uh, state agencies into some of our planning decisions. So um, having that early coordination and bringing them into our uh, planning processes. So then when we get to the end of the process, we're looking for a permit or, or some other kind of uh, decision and um, some of that's been taken into consideration in the, in the design and the development of the project. Yeah, I think we touched on this a little earlier. Um, but I think, you know, some of these structures we have in place make this really difficult and maybe <clears throat> what has to happen is, you know, being as Part of a corridor plan has to be a first step before you can pass go on on any other um, process of, of getting in a long range plan or going through a NEPA process or, or whatever. Because um, it does seem like we have, at least in states I work in, various different types of processes, planning or otherwise, that are not necessarily connected and what ultimately gets funded is not the same thing as what ultimately might get permitted or what is you know, really um, in line with, with long-term solutions and, and the latest science. And so <clears throat> taking a look at some of those structures and how we can better um, synchronize them, I think is, is gonna be really important as we move forward. Great, thank you. So uh, in wrapping up uh, this part of the webinar, um, I wanna give everyone on the panel a chance uh, to mention anything uh, that maybe you've already mentioned, but wanna really stress or something that uh, you didn't get a chance to mention that uh, has been prompted by any of these questions or reflect on what are the biggest challenges to or biggest opportunities for planning and implementing resilient and, and equitable coastal transport infrastructure. So um, does anyone wanna kick that off? I can start. <laughs> um, I mean, I think a number of things have come up over, over and over again. Um, certainly this idea of uh, how of planning, I think is the one thing that we've heard um, a lot of times and how do we line up planning with money. Um, and the other thing that I think is, is the biggest conflict, which is maybe reflected in that is, is politics versus policy. And what we see a lot of times are uh, legacy highway projects or projects which are, are favored by certain um, uh, political actors for certain reasons and the, those preferences um, really getting in the way of more objective scientific long-term planning processes and so how we square all of that I think is is a really big challenge particularly given um, <clears throat> when we think of the length of political terms versus the length of the time it takes to plan and implement a, a highway project um, so more coordination, uh, better planning. I would ask for um, more oversight than less from the federal government. Um, the use of the most up-to-date science and really broad um, 
public participation and oversight, I think are all ways that we make sure we end up making uh, wise investments of resources. Great, thanks. Any other closing thoughts? I think Kim hit on a lot of good points there. Uh, planning, prioritization, early collaboration, looking at the full picture of the corridors rather than just little postage stamp uh, locations. Um, we, I didn't talk about phased adaptation. That may need to be a, a key part of some of this as we move forward as there's limited um, dollars. Um, and, and hopefully we can show some successes and, and be able to get our arms around the inventory of needs so that we can uh, position things for future funding opportunities. Yeah, I would uh, agree with Jeremy and, and Kim for sure. There's a lot of challenges, but a lot of opportunities. You know, I think we have funding now, we have five years of funding with the bill. So I think we have the opportunity to go, you know, to think like, how are we gonna use this five years and this funding as well as we can and, and the, the planning considerations um, for sure. I think we need to think a little bit more. We didn't talk a whole lot about metrics, but I think that's a big thing that I know a lot of um, folks here at the department and CTOTs are thinking about how do we understand how well we're doing as we're making these investments. Um, and so I think I think there's, there's a lot of excitement. I'm, I'm really optimistic. Um, I, I know there are a lot of challenges, but I'm really continue to be excited and, op and opt op optimistic about what we can do in the next few years. Um, and I wanted to mention, because Jackie said I could, that we do have some opportunities within the Department of Transportation in terms of uh, employment opportunities. Uh, we are looking to hire folks within the Office of the Secretary and across our, our modal administration. So if you're interested, we're hiring. We would love to have you and your expertise. We have a lot of work to do. And um, we, we know there's some really great ideas about how to do our work better out there. So we're really excited to, to, to have some new folks joining us soon. So please reach out if you're interested. Um, and I'd be happy to, to talk more and put you in touch with the right folks on those job opportunities. Thank you, Heather. That's great. Okay, so we're nearing the end of our time here. I want to say just a few quick closing words. Uh, first, thank you again to all of the three panelists for a great presentation and really helpful discussion. Um, second, I want to thank the webinar organizing team uh, Elizabeth Lossos, uh, Rachel Kar Karazak, uh, Sarah Mason at the Nichols in Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions, and Grace Hansen at the Coastal Flood Resilience Project. If you um, have any questions or would like to follow up, please feel free to email anyone on the team, uh, and we'll post our email messages links in the chat right now. Um, and we will be uh, providing to all the registrants uh, a link to the webinar recording, and we'll be posting it on the website of the sponsoring organizations, along with the read ahead material that was mentioned earlier. Uh, and I think it'd be great if we could add a list of uh, some of the links that were mentioned by various panelists uh, today. So if you have links that you want us to include, panelists, please send those along and We'll collect those in a single place. Uh, and with that, um, thank you to all the audience for joining us today. Uh, and with that, uh, I think we'll say goodbye.